I'd like to welcome Thanos Sophius to the stage. This man knows shipping. If anyone knows shipping, this man knows shipping. He, um, he's been innovating in shipping, and he's speaking to us today about democratizing shipping investments. Uh, back on stage after the FTQ, which was the first investor summit that we did in Greece in October 2020. In Kia, would you please welcome Thanos Sophius? Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great, great pleasure for me being here. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, for the kind invitation. I'm Thanos Sofios, and I will uh, give you a, a 15-minute presentation on our aim to democratize shipping as an asset class. Uh, we start with uh, our disclaimer. It basically says don't listen to what he says, and especially don't rely on anything that he says. We are asset managers in the shipping space. Um, we aim to open exciting and difficult to access markets to all investors. Um, and we provide the necessary education and research support to assist with the investment process. We started uh, like six years ago and we now have uh, three ETFs listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, before starting my presentation, I will give you a small um, uh, some facts about the ETF industry. ETF is the acronym of exchange traded funds. They are like mutual funds, but they are traded in a stock exchange like any other stock. Uh, they could follow the price of an index like uh, S&P 500 or invest in a thematic basket of stocks or bonds or follow the price of a commodity like uh, gold, oil or wheat. Actually anything a mutual fund would do, but in a much more efficient way. On the chart here, you see the evolution in the number of ETFs globally, almost 9,000 ETFs, approx 10 trillion US dollars in assets under management. 70% of these ETFs are traded in the US markets, and 77% are controlled by three firms, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. The next 10 firms control 18%, and, and uh, almost 200 smaller firms compete for the remaining 5%. The small guys uh, pull in twice their fair share in new assets, but 25% of them won't make it and close down in the first one or two years. Some of the keys to success in this industry, a unique proposition, a pre-identified investor's base, and the first mover's advantage. In, uh, yep. in my presentation, I will give you an overview of the shipping industry, what drives this market, why, when, and how to invest in shipping. As we are almost at the end of the day, I will make one or two temperature checks to see if you're still with me, <laughs> or just go out and grab some drinks. Uh, the vast majority of things, uh, commodities, uh, products, are transported by ships. Uh, transportation here is, is, is measured by tone mile, one tone of freight, carried one mile. As you can see, 85% are ocean freight, 9% uh, uh, road, 6 rail, and this less than 1% Christos was talking about in his presentation for air cargo. So 85% of almost anything that is being moved is being moved by ships. Erling Naes, a legendary ship owner, used to say that, uh, Norwegian ship owner, used to say that uh, God must have been a ship owner as he placed all raw materials far away from where they were needed and covered two thirds of the earth with water. Uh, within seaborne sea trade, uh, almost uh, half of it is uh, dry bulk commodities, a quarter is uh, oil, and the rest is containers, gas, and uh, chemicals. This is how a big, uh, big bulker looks like. This one has seven hatches and is a Panamax. It's called the Panamax because it's uh, the largest dry bulk vessel that can cross the Panama Canal. Uh, bigger than these are the Cape sizes, that they are too big to cross the canal, so they have to go around Cape Horn of South America. Smaller sizes, Handys and Supras, have uh, onboard cranes and are more versatile. These ladies in, in the shipping world or vessels are female. 
mainly carry iron ore, coal, and uh, grains. Major exporting regions are Australia, South Africa, Brazil, and North America. And these commodities go mainly to China, and uh, to Asia, and especially China. Okay, that was uh, dry bulk. And this is how a big tanker looks like, a VLCC, a very large crude carrier. These big crude tankers take the crude oil out of the underwater or underground oil fields and transfer, them, transfer it to the refineries. And from the refineries, smaller tankers, the so-called product tankers, take the oil products like diesel, jet fuel, etc., for further distribution. Half of the 7,000 or so tankers are being used to transfer crude oil and the other half uh, oil products. These are the different types of uh, tankers. And this is the time for the first temperature check. Why a Suez Max is called the Suez Max? Suez Canal. You're still with me, no drinks yet. <laughs> Okay, it seems uh, that um, major oil producing regions are the Middle East, of course, uh, the US, Brazil, Venezuela, and major consuming regions, Europe and Asia, India, China, and uh, Japan. So what drives the shipping market? Ship owners and charterers define freight rates, which are measured by dollars per day for the dry bulk, or dollars per tonne for the wet side, for the tankers. As in all industries, demand and supply define the price. The price in shipping is freight rates. So demand for main commodities and supply of ships that are available out there for transporting these commodities define freight rates, how much it costs to lease a ship. Um, when demand exceeds supply, freight rates go up, and the opposite. Dry bulk is Asia-focused. Actually, construction and infrastructure spending are the main drivers for steel. To make steel, you need iron ore, and you need to transport the iron ore from far away. So infrastructure building is the main driver, and to a lesser extent, energy demand also plays a role, as coal still remains a large part of the global electricity generation. Uh, oil is more, more dispersed, is more uh, a thing of global economic growth. So demand is clear, and it has to do mainly with global economic growth. In my opinion, the supply side has been always the biggest problem for shipping. When things are good and ship owners may make money, they tend to build more new ships. And this oversupply of ships, when it when happens, it dampens freight rates. Currently, for various reasons, the order book for both dry to your left and wet to your right um, are at historical low levels. And the demand for both sectors looks fine. So we expect that the demand supply balance will further recover in the next two or three years. Why invest in shipping? It's real economy. We like to say that uh, shipping is the lifeblood of global economy and it plays a vital part in uh, commodities trading. There is no correlation between shipping freight rates and any other major asset classes like equities or bonds. So that makes it an excellent diversifier in an investor, investor's portfolio. And also due to this uncorrelated nature, uh, an allocation into shipping may improve overall risk-adjusted return, returns. It could also be used as a levered play on the commodity cycle. Is shipping a buy and hold asset class? That's a rhetoric question. Uh, shipping is not a buy and hold asset class, and this comes to when to invest in shipping. Shipping is very volatile. Um, it is rather ideal for tactical moves. Shipping is, is cyclical. Uh, when things feel doomy, it's the right time to invest. If you feel that, uh, if you're trying to buy shipping when things are great, most probably you're making the wrong investment decision. Also, shipping is seasonal. 
Uh, for dry, bank, uh, dry bulk, for instance, seasonality is very profound. The second half of each year should be expected to be stronger in terms of freight rates. How to invest in shipping? You can buy stocks from public companies, listed companies. You can put money in private equity that buys real ships, or you can buy or build your own real ship. This is real asset ownership and valuations here are driven by freight rates. Or you can invest directly in the freight futures market or buy a, an ETF that buys freight futures. Here, on these two options, you get a direct exposure to freight rates. If we had to compete to compare freight futures and public uh, uh, equities here, let's say, in our example, uh, public tanker equities. In, in this chart, you see the different behavior between the two uh, ways of, uh, of investing. W with freight futures, you get a direct exposure to freight rates with high volatility, which implies, of course, of course higher risk, but also higher potential returns. And overall, it's supposed to be a more attractive trading vehicle. On the other hand, with stocks, you get all the risks when investing in public companies, operational management, financial, and the broader market risk, which means that your uh, equity uh, shares may be falling, not because freight rates are falling, but because the, the, the rest of the equity markets is falling. Now a quick uh, step back to look at freight futures. What are futures? Futures are agreement to buy or sell a standardized asset at, se at a specific future date, at a specific uh, uh, price. And uh, freight futures are contracts that reflect this expected future level of freight rates. It's not an easy or cheap market for the investor, though, to, to go and uh, uh, buy freight futures. It's uh, they are contracts of, la of large value. It's an over-the-counter market, uh, which, me which means that it's voice brokering. brokering. There's no electronic platform that trade uh, freight futures. And uh, investors need separate clearing accounts and direct rela relationships with specialized brokers. And here comes our solution. The freight futures ETF that we created allow investors to gain a direct exposure to freight futures through the US public markets, like they would buy any other stock in the stock exchange. And we offer two freight future funds, one for dry bulk shipping, be dry, and one for um, crude tankers shipping, be wet. These two investment products were the first and still only publicly listed products that invest directly in, in, in freight futures. BDRY provides a long exposure to the dry bulk market through a portfolio of near-dated freight futures. We launched this product five years ago and uh, is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. In 2021, BDRY was the best performing ETF in the world with more than 250% annual return. In 2022, though, was among the worst performing ETFs in the world, and now in 2023, it is close to, all time, to its all-time low. But as you know by now, shipping is cyclical. This fund, at the end of last quarter, had 100 million US dollars in assets under management. Big Wet, it's something we just launched like a month ago. It's the same thing, but it, uh, it's for tanker freight rates and it's, it just had, has 3 million of USD in assets under management. So to conclude, and go for drinks. Ah no, before concluding, what's the relationship between them? Actually, there is no relationship. There is no correlation between tankers and dry bulk, as each market is driven by its own idiosyncratic fundamentals. And to conclude, Shipping freight rates is a real economy asset class, and for us, for some analysts, actually a leading indicator for the broader macro picture. 
It has no correlation with other asset class, classes, which makes it a very good diversifier. But it's not for all inver investors. It's volatile. You have to have the stomach to digest the volatility. It's a high risk, high return product. You, you just need to follow shipping fundamentals and have access to market information. And this is something we provide on a regular basis. In any case, if you think to invest in shipping before going out and buy a ship on your own, um, <laughs> uh, it could be a good idea to test the waters with a, a safer, easier to use, and much more transparent investment product like Be Dry or Be Wet, which, by the way, as they are ETFs, you can always short them and uh, make money if you think freight rates are too high and they are going to fall in the next uh, uh, period. See our site for all the information you may need, as well as uh, research and daily markets insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It occurs to me that between you and Christo Spiro and uh, uh, Charles Bourbonnier yesterday, high vox vox, that we can get some sort of insider information or something going on here. We've got time for two quick questions um, for, for Thanos. We've got Gio, thank you. And we've got Alex, please, Alex, Gio. You can go first. Yeah, okay. Hi there, great. Thanks very much. Great. Over here, great. <laughs> um, I, I trade uh, options, equity options. Is the options side of this particular ETFs? Liquid yes, for, for trading those? They are. These, okay. these ETFs have already options uh, traded uh, as well. But I didn't mention it. Okay. Great. Thanks. Excellent. Great. And Giovanni, please. And then with your experience, what is the greatest paradigm shift that you have witnessed in the last 10 years in this industry? What do you mean paradigm? So let's say where you used to have heavy equipment that you transferred, automobiles that you transferred, and it was great, wonderful revenue. And then there was a shift because people started building manufacturing facilities closer to their consumer base, and therefore you had less clientele. I see. So what is the greatest, you know, last 20 years, what is the greatest change that you have witnessed and experienced? COVID-19. Okay, that's, that's close, that's three years. Why? <laughs> because actually when COVID-19 happened in the, the beginning of 2020, you remember China closed down? Yep. You remember all these guys running around in white uniforms uh, in, in, in the cities? China, dry bulk is a China-driven business yep. industry. So China closed down all its uh, uh, ports and factories. Freight rates went down to zero. There was no shipping activities. There, no iron ore, no coal, no nothing into China. So um, freight, freight, freight rates went down. People though, investors, realized that uh, the sky is not gonna fall on our heads and uh, economies are gonna start moving again. Very good, and the second question is, wasn't it true the Panama Canal was blocked by uh, you know, a large uh, vessel for a number of weeks? Pardon me, Suez? The Suez Canal, the Suez Canal, yes. Yeah, yeah, and that, that costs millions, yes? Correct, correct. That was a, a, a disruptor as well. And this caused huge delays and raised freight rates. So that was good for the business as well. Very good. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanos, thank you so much for your presentation. Really outstanding. Thank you. Thank you.